Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jeff. Let's give the boys another round of applause to uh, Noah and TJ. It is Easter morning, and on Easter Sunday, when you come to church, you wonder what's the pastor going to preach on today. You ever wonder about that? No. The unfortunate part about it is if you're one of the C and E crowd, the Christmas and Easter crowd, you probably only hear two sermons a year, and that's the, the birth and the resurrection. You miss all of the rest of the story. So I would encourage you to come a few times in the middle so that you might see and hear what else is going on. I might want to turn my mic on, too. Is that better, Clyde? Yeah. All right. So at any rate, today we are in the Gospel of John, and yes, I am going to preach about the resurrection, so you're going to get to hear it again. Uh, praise be to God. So we're in John chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 1 to 18. It's simply titled, The Resurrection of Jesus. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have take, laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple ran out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying. One on the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing her to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had seen these things, that she told them that he had said these things to her. All right. It's always fitting when we do a baptism on Easter morning because symbolically, a, a baptism is death and rebirth. Just like the butterflies, the chrysalis, that, that that was is born again, but born again more beautifully. That's why we use the butterflies for part of the decor for Easter Sunday. And unfortunately, we will have to take the, the butterflies down unless we forget before next week. But it is symbolic of that, that resurrection, that coming forth. And that's what baptism is. We think of our baptism as we've died to our old self and we've risen anew. Unfortunately, we don't keep that focus very long for many of us. All too often, baptism becomes a rite of passage. It's like when we get to be a certain age, grandma or dad or mom or aunt or someone is telling us, or our Sunday school teacher is telling us we need to get baptized, and so we relent and we get baptized. Because we've seen our friends get baptized and we've seen others get baptized. Now, one of the interesting things is when you do an adult baptism or when you baptize people that are as old as T.J. and Tony are, and not 12 or 13, you know they've had more time to think about it. And you hope that they've really taken it to task. Myself, I can remember, I can remember both my baptisms. I was baptized as a younger child. My mother was always very efficient about baptisms. We belonged to the United Church of Christ, and mother waited to have all eight of us baptized at the same time. So mother's efficient. So we all lined up and the minister baptized us. So I, it wasn't like I had anything to do with it other than that I loaded in the station wagon and went there that day and got baptized. 
But when I was baptized as an adult at Sunset Hills Baptist Church in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, by Reverend Mark Stevens, if you, uh, if you would know Mark, but Mark was an interesting guy, I liked Mark. And Mark uh, never pressured me to be baptized. In fact, the gentleman I've talked before about Palmer Swinson, the gentleman that married Gail and I, and he's the gentleman that baptized Gail, and Gail really wanted him to do our wedding because he was our minister. But Palmer, when I agreed to, you know, wanted to get married and join the church, he was really pushing me to get rebaptized because he thought it was very important. And I told you the story before that one of the only two times in my life that I'm really certain that the Holy Spirit spoke to me without hesitation was when I was told one evening, out of the clear blue, that I need to be baptized. And it just popped into my head, well, I do need to be baptized. And being the obedient soul that I am, I waited several months to get baptized. I argued with the Spirit, but the Spirit kept nagging me, Roy, you need to be baptized. That's what you need to have. You need to remember that baptism. You need to be, you need to stay firm in that baptism because you are a new creation. Just as Christ was a resurrected spirit, a resurrected God. The idea of baptism is that you have joined him in that journey into death and rebirth. New birth. You are a new creation. You are not only that, but you're now a member of the church. This week we have four more members in our church than we had a week ago. Because we baptized on Sunday night last week, Will McCoy. So we've got four new gentlemen that are now members of our church. That's a celebration. We should praise God for that one. That's on that first Easter morning, Mary ran, or Mary went to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. Now, in John's gospel, we know that, that, that Nicodemus uh, had also, and, uh, and Joseph and Arimathea had taken a considerable amount of spices and anointed Jesus' body. But Mary, probably thinking that a woman's the only one that can do something right, which she probably is right, uh, my wife would confirm that, uh, she's going again to anoint the body, to make sure the job was done correctly. When she gets there, the, the, the stone has been rolled away, and she goes and gets the men, and Peter goes in. And one of the interesting things about the scripture when you read, people can argue that the body was stolen and somebody snuck it off or what have you, uh, the grave robbers, and grave robbers was a common thing in that day. Uh, grave robbers was, has always been something that was a reality in the world. And some can argue that grave robbers came and took the Lord. But if a grave robber went in there, first of all, they probably wouldn't have left the, the uh, funeral shroud folded up because, now it's not so clear in this writing, but we are told that the funeral shroud and the face covering are folded up. They're not just tossed in the corner. If, if a grave robber was coming to do it in a hurry, he most certainly would to dilly dally to spend time, unless he had the most you know, compulsive, obsessive nature in the world, wouldn't stop to fold up the grave cross. They would have been tossed over to the side, or like I said, they would have gone with him because they would have just grabbed it and ran. So to me, that's one of the proofs that something meticulous happened there, something miraculous happened there. And the thing that brought me to Christian faith, and I don't know if I've ever shared that with you, because I'm I have professed I was an atheist for a part of my life. And it wasn't really until I was with Gail that I became Christian. I was married to it before, and I, and I committed the sin of, of divorce, but in that first marriage, I really wasn't a Christian. I didn't believe in it. I was going along with it because she wanted to do it in the church. I could care, could have cared less. It wouldn't have bothered me a bit to go to the judge, but of course you have to have a big fancy. We even did it in a different church than her home church because she needed a church that was bigger than this one even to, to have the wedding in because she had to have this grandiose wedding. But it wasn't until I started reading the Bible to argue with people about the Bible that I suddenly discovered something. And that was how foolish and how crazy the story is concerning the disciples and Jesus' resurrection. They wouldn't have written it this way. Something happened in that tomb. Something meticulous 
It included folding up those grave cloths. Because immediately after this experience, those disciples changed so much. Just a few days before, they ran away from trouble and hid, except for Peter and John. The rest of them were nowhere to be found. But they changed. They changed into something crazy, something bold, something powerful, something brave. Because nearly all of them were martyred and went to suffer for their faith. Something happened to Paul on that road to Damascus. Because he changed from someone persecuting the church to someone that was willing to stand up to anything and even the chance of death. And if you don't believe that something happened to that, I don't know what, I don't know how I can explain it to you. We are not just people of an empty cross. We are people of the empty tomb. Because there are so many religions in this world, you can't begin to fathom how many thousands of religions there are, but there is only one empty tomb in all of them. In all the rest, their leaders, their savior, their messiah, what have you, they died and they disappeared. Only one rose again and lives with us in our hearts, in our minds, in our congregation to this day. That's the message of Easter. The risen Christ, the empty tomb. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you so very much for the message of Easter, the empty tomb, the risen Christ. Lord, forgive us when we fall short of fulfilling the commitments of our own baptisms. Lord, let it renew us this day, watching and witnessing these young men devote themselves to you. Lord, let us be strengthened by that. Let us be reinvigorated by that. Let us walk forth from here today as those that have risen to a new life. We pray this in your loving glory. Amen.